Galatians chapter 5, turn there. Galatians chapter 5. If the money lady's bothering you, don't let her, well, let her do it. She's the money lady. She, she, Melissa, you got my permission to aggravate this woman all you want to up here on the front row. You got my permission to come up here and sit in her lap if you want to. All right. Galatians, Galatians 5, 13. There is a, uh, I'm going to make sure I'm in the right place. Yeah, this is where I started out la last week. Let me read this, and I'm going to touch on some things on Romans 8 that I didn't get a chance to do last Sunday morning. Galatians 5.13, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you divide, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Uh, this, and let me say this about what's going on in Seattle, the autonomous zone. Um, and I'm going to show you some things this morning about that during the sermon that is, I mean, scary because they tried the, the Antifa and the anarchists. Anarchist means no government. They want no government. And, but really what's behind it is a communist takeover of America. And it's a dead serious one. This is not something that a fringe movement is trying to play. You have the major leaders of the Democrat Party who are trying to destroy as much of this country as it can because it's the only way to get their power and agenda in place. It's the only way. And so um, it's not just the fact that they've maintained their position in Seattle, Washington, to me, is dangerous enough. But they tried Asheville, North Carolina. Now, to me, North Carolina is full of bubbas. You know what that means? Good old boys. Okay, that don't take, that carry guns, don't take nothing. And I called one of them yesterday to see what was going on. And he said, yes, that the anarchist Antifa uh, extreme communist socialist college student type stuff. They tried to set up an autonomous zone, which means a no government zone, no police, no fire, no first responders, no protection, no military, no uh, National Guard. They tried to set up a zone in Asheville, North Carolina. And I, I'm just going, that's not San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. That's hillbilly land. And they tried it. And they had it set up for about a f four or five hours, but they were finally run out. Okay? And uh, there's some more to it that I'm going to tell you later. Uh, because some guys stood their ground with weapons. Now, not everybody can carry a weapon. I understand that. Not everybody can fire one. But you ought to be thankful for the ones that can because they're the ones who are going to either defend this land or lose it while they die. Okay? And that's exactly how it's going to go down. But the fact that they tried this in an area of the country that is not particularly known for its extreme liberalism tells me that they don't have a problem moving out beyond their safety. Right now, the city council and the mayor of Seattle is allowing this to go on. They want it to go on. They voted for it. 
they voted to not let cops use tear gas in Seattle to make sure that the police have no power in there whatsoever to drive them out. So they want this in Seattle, okay? But whether the other areas of the country want it or not, it's coming. So just kind of hang on to that, all right? Um, but that's, my point is this, I will tell you that eventually what happens in communism and socialism is that it is a devouring form of government. It devours everything. In Soviet Russia, who owned the factories? Who owned the people who made cars and radios and TVs? Who owned that? The government owned it. The government kept all the profits. The government owned it. They, and they consumed all of that money that they profited from it. They consumed it. They, it was gone through. It was totally gone. So then after a while, what money is there to keep stealing? None. Once you've taken out of the, the kitty, the till... Once you keep taking out of it, there's nothing left to take and, they, and it starts collapsing on itself. And I've, I've watched videos, I spent all weekend watching videos of people who snuck in to the autonomous zone. And there's a, if you've, they've changed the name from Chaz to Chop. And I will, I'm not telling you why now, but it's not funny. It is a, it is a, very serious thing why they called it chop but eventually socialism and communism and that ideology it devours itself and because there are no police there was a murder friday night saturday morning in the autonomous zone two people were shot one of them was dead on arrival the other one is in critical condition the police have no ability nor authority to even find out who did it. So who's going who's gonna to deal with that now? Who's going to take care of that? Who's going to make sure that those who were guilty of that are prosecuted and punished? No one is, which means they're still there and they're going to do it again. And the amount of infighting that is taking place in that autonomous zone is incredible. They're, I know. Listen, I'm going to tell you right straight out, and you be mad at me all you want. If you watch CNN, you need to go out and cut the cable cord of your television. If you're watching CNN or NBC News or CBS News or ABC News or whatever, if you're watching those, they are telling you a deliberate lie. And they know it's a lie. They want you to think that it's Woodstock all over again inside there. And it's not. It is a crazy, drug-fueled, rapist colony. And murder colony is what it is. And what he's saying here, if you look in, back in 15, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And I'll say this to a church, to this church. Whoever you decided to go against whoever you decide to gossip about, whoever you decide to devour, they're coming after you or somebody else is coming after you. And all of a sudden now we have no church left because everybody ran everybody out. So walk in the spirit. You should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 16, for the flesh lust of the against spirit, spirit against flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so these cannot do the things that you would, but if you led, be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, I'm not going to re recover all of that, but I want you to look at Romans 8, turn there, and there's a particular thing I want to, I want to address related to that at, before we move on in Galatians. In Galatians 5, he gives a list. Um, it's one of several lists in the Bible of things to not do. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Let's pick it up in verse 10. 
And I'm going to read down to where I'm going to, but I'm going to give you the context. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So what he's saying is God is the, God the father is the one who raised up God the son from the dead. And he's saying because you are followers of Christ, because you are sons of God, God then will do what he did with Jesus. He will do it for you. He will raise you back up. In that sense, do not fear death. Don't fear it. Now, just saying that to you, it's like you saying it to me. I'm going to fear death anyway. Okay? But... I know where I'm going. I want everybody else to know where I'm going. By not just what I say here today, but by the life that I live. I, want, I don't want it to be a mystery or a secret when I die. Well, I wonder if he made it or not. I want you to know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. And in that sense there, I don't fear death. I fear dying. Okay, and hurting and the pain that would be associated with death. So I hope it's very quick and instant. Like, go ahead and cut my head off. That way I won't have to worry about it. But death itself, we know where we're going. And if you don't know where you're going, then I want you to be afraid of death. I want you to be very afraid of death until you do something about it. Um, so anyway, verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now here's verse 14. This is what I wanted to get to for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Underline that in your Bible. They are. You are the sons of God. And in this, and in this area, God sees you then as equals with his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible calls us joint heirs with Jesus. So let's say that, um, let's say that my dad was a secret closet billionaire. And he had all that money in a bank somewhere and he put it in his will that after so many years after his death, then his billion dollars would be given to his children. And he could stipulate in the will that either one of the children gets more than the other, or he could say they all get an equal share. That makes them joint heirs. Everybody understand that? Everybody gets a, the same piece. Doesn't matter if you're the older, the younger, the adopted, doesn't matter. You all get the same cut, okay? I have a life insurance policy. When I die, I want my children to all get an equal piece of the inheritance. I believe in that. I believe strongly in what I have being passed. I don't want the courts to end up with it. That's why you write out a will or as you get older, you let one of your children sort of be a guardian, a custodian of all your accounts and stuff like that. That way, when you die, they get to keep it all instead of it ended up in the courts and the courts don't know what to do with it. So they just sell it off to anybody. I don't believe in that. I believe that the children are to get that. I don't think the government ought to tax it. That's that was wrong. But anyway, um, 
So he says, they are sons of God. Verse 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, what? Today's Father's Day. So today, my son called me, Happy Father's Day, Dad. And my other son sent me a text, Happy Father's Day, Dad, I love you. Both of them, even though one's adopted, both of them, I see them as equals. And they both call me dad. And they don't fight over who's more dad or who's more son than the other. They don't do that. They never have. They know that I love them both. They know that I do for them both. I took them deer hunting. Took them both. Taught them how to shoot. Taught them how to kill a deer. Tried to teach them how to skin it. They didn't want anything to do with that at first. I understand that. Okay. But I did as much with one as I did with the other. And they don't see one another as being different sons. They are the same. And in that sense, this is the reason why when God gave us his spirit and years ago I changed how I prayed I stopped calling him God in my prayers I started calling him my father because that's how I see him he is my father and often I will look up to heaven when I'm alone and I will say thank you for being my father and letting me be your son because I've never known a greater father and I had a good dad but I've never known a greater father than the one that I have and I've always always wanted to be a good dad to my children always wanted that Failed a lot, but I still do. Now that they're pretty much all grown, I still want to be number one dad every year. And I hate losing out to some guy who's got a t-shirt that says number one dad. I'm going, I thought I was. So now, this is important. This is important. If you're a son of God, it means you are saved. If you are not saved, you are not a son of God. Amen? Okay, now, turn to 2 Samuel 7. This is important. It is very important. I would say that my understanding of God increased dramatically. When I understood this idea, I knew that um, when Lisa and I had Lindsay, she was our first. I knew then that God was showing me now that Mike, now that you're a dad, because Gloria, remember the first night we brought Lindsay home from the hospital? I grew up, I grew up from a boy to a man in five minutes. Because first night we brought her home from the hospital, we were just fixing to go to bed, we laid Lindsay down on the bed and she stopped breathing right there. And I was never more scared in my life. And we called Sterling and Glory over, they come running over, they were already in bed. And it seemed like it took us forever to get her breathing again. And all that night, instead of laying her in her crib next to our bed, we laid her in our bed next to us and neither one of us slept that night. And every time she'd make a sound, we'd look and check on her. And God dealt with me that night. He said, Mike, here's a human being now. She doesn't only 
require you to get up and go to work tomorrow so she'll have something to eat. She's depending on you for even the very breath that she has in her lungs. Now grow up. And buddy, I did. That changed me because at that point, there wasn't anything that I wasn't going to do for that child. And then as I grew older and she grew older, I started seeing me in her. And that was scary. It's like me now. And I can see the things that I do and just mannerisms that I have. I'm going, oh my gosh, that's my dad. I've turned into my father. Oh no. But that's how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to turn into your, fa your father, your mother. Amen? You're supposed to be like them. So then the idea of how long am I God's son? How long? How long is Matthew going to be my son? That's not ever going to change. How long is Caleb going to be my son? That's not ever going to change. So look in 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. When thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee. Now what David wanted was to build the temple. But he had blood on his hands. God said, that's not for you to do. Your job was to put down all the enemies. You're a warrior, David, not a builder. You're a destroyer. You have to destroy all the enemies before I can build my house. But your son is going to build the house. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He's partially talking about Solomon, but he's fully talking about Jesus, who was of the seed of David, the bowels of David. And he said in verse 13, he shall build an house for my name, Solomon and Jesus. And I will, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The throne of Solomon's kingdom was not established forever. The throne of Jesus' kingdom will be and is. I will be his father. He shall be my son. Do you see it now? He's talking about Solomon and he's talking about Jesus. And look what he said. I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, what will I do to him? Throw him out? No, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And Saul was the king right before David. So I looked at that one day. And I said to myself, what's the difference? What's the difference? Here's Solomon of the house of David. Here's Saul of the house of Benjamin. What was the difference between them? And I started making a list of all the known sins that Solomon committed. And we have them because first of all, whoever was writing the chronicles of King Solomon wrote him down. But then we have Solomon himself in Ecclesiastes confessing to everything that he did. I had women, a bunch of them. I had wine. I had parties. I had music. I had chariots, which the modern version of that is. I had big trucks and fast cars. Okay? I had a 600 chariot garage at home. It took Solomon seven years to build the house of God. It took him 13 years to build his own house. That I'd tell you something. He spent six more years putting stuff in his own house that he didn't do for God. He probably spent more money, twice the money, 
and twice the labor building his own house than he did for the house of God. And then on top of that, he built pagan temples all around Jerusalem because the wives that he were marrying were daughters of kings around him. And they all worshipped Baal and Milcom and Chemosh and all these other, and Ashtaroth and all these pagan gods and goddesses. So he built them all temples because they said, Honey, I want to worship my gods. So he did it. You know why? Because the Bible says Solomon loved many strange women. And I've seen some strange women. And he built them all temples and burn in, went in and burned incense with them. Not only is he guilty of all the sexual impurity and immorality, a ladies' man, and he got away with it, not only did he build all these temples, he went in and worshipped these other gods. But if you read Ecclesiastes, he says, Man, I kept my wisdom. Well, what kind of wisdom is that? He's analyzing his life. He's thinking about it and all the things he's doing. And God let him do this for 40 years. For 40 years he did this. He partied. He drank. He slept with women. He did everything. He had all the money, power, everything that every man could want. And at the end of his life, he sits down and he writes, It was vanity. It was a waste. Can you imagine them? He said, you don't have no idea the amount of money I wasted, the amount of puking I did, the amount of hangovers I had, the number of women, both that I, I mean, how many women is enough? How many women is enough? I knew a guy told me, he said, I've had about 180 of them, 180 women, different women. Yeah, well, Solomon had a thousand. How many is enough? And I bet then he didn't have enough. And to rich people, there is no such thing as enough. It's always more, more, more. Jeffrey Epstein, more, 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 more. Bill Clinton, more, 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 more. You name it. Politicians, businessmen, bankers. There's never enough. So that's what Solomon did. And yet we have one sin that Saul committed. One. Written for us in the Bible. All these things Solomon did. And yet God said, I will never take my mercy from him. I'll always forgive him. But he stopped having mercy on Saul. Why? It wasn't the amount of sins, it was the type. We don't see Saul with a thousand women. We don't see Saul drunk. We don't see Saul snorting crack, doing heroin, building fancy houses, worshiping false gods. We don't see Saul doing any of that. We see one time where Samuel said, Saul, this is thus saith the Lord. This is what I want you to do. And when Saul went and did that, he only half did it. He kept, he spared the king's life, kept the cattle of the king, all the sheep and all that stuff, and the money. When Samuel confronted him, Samuel said to him, how is it? That you didn't do what God told you to do. And Saul's response was, yes I did. And Samuel said, then why do I hear sheep in the background? Why do I hear sheep bleeding and bang? Where do sheep come from? Then Saul blames it on everybody. Oh, the people said they wanted that. And I, and I, and I got them so I could make a sacrifice. Well, which is it? Saul, did, this, did the people keep the sheep or was you going to use them to make a sacrifice? Which is it? And that's when Samuel said to obey is better than sacrifice. 
And then he said, well, what, why is the king still alive? I brought him as my prisoner. Well, God told you to kill him. So Saul's rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is, is as idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected thee. And that is the difference, right? That from that moment forward, God never forgave Saul ever. So right after that, Saul said, the Lord pardon me. And Samuel said, nope. Nope. God's not forgiven you of anything. From that second, God never forgave Saul his sin. Now, is that related to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is the one unforgivable sin? I think it is. I think it is. He rejected the power and the authority of the Word of God and the way the Holy Spirit brings guilt to a person so they confess their sin. Saul didn't do that. He lied, blamed it on everybody else to get away with it, to make it look like he partially obeyed, made it look like it was total obedience, and it wasn't. And God rejected him right then and there. And then later, the Bible says, and God removed his spirit from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord came. And vexed Saul. What did Saul, every time Saul saw David, what did he do to him? Thread, try to throw a spear at him. Why? Because David represented the Lord. And Saul was trying to kill him all the days of his life. And David wouldn't touch him. David wouldn't retaliate. Not even when David was standing over his sleeping body. David had a chance to kill him. And David took, what, his spear or something like that and sent word back to him and said, I was standing over you last night. What, listen, you snore. I could have had you if I wanted to. Why don't you leave me alone? And Saul never did. And then at the end of Saul's life, right before he dies, he's going to go to battle the next day. And the Bible specifically says that God was not going to speak to Saul by prophet, by Urim and Thummim, or by vision. God was not going to tell Saul nothing. So who's he turned over to? A witch, palm reader, astrologer, someone who had a familiar spirit, and she conjured up gods, devils, literally come up out of the ground, one of them looking like Samuel. That was the religion that God turned Saul over to, and Saul had to fall on his sword the next day to keep the enemies from killing him himself. God rejected him. The Bible specifically says God rejected him. So, here's the point. If you're saved, if you're a son of God and you sin, is God going to reject you? He hasn't yet, has he? What's he going to do to you? He's going to whip you. He's going to whip you. I've had them. They're not fun. I'd rather have my mama whip me. And she whipped hard. I'd rather have her do it all over again than God. Turn to uh, Psalm 89. Let me show you a second witness of this. Psalm 89, we're eventually going to get to uh, Galatians 5, 19, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. It's a whole list of them here, and I dug up about four lists of different sins. Psalm 89, verse 20, I found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. Underline these passages as you read them because you're going to need these probably this year. You're going to need them. Because let me tell you something. 
the autonomous zone people hate Christians. Hate them. They almost killed one who went in that zone to preach. They would have killed him. Instead, they just sexually assaulted him. A homosexual man grabbed him. I'm going to show you a picture of it. Grabbed him and started kissing him on the face. Okay? Because the man went in there to preach. And they run him out. So he said, but my, verse 24, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall make, he shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn. Look at that. God's making you his firstborn. He's making you equal with Jesus in the sense that he's going to love you. And he's going to make you a joint heir. Now, he shall cry unto me, thou art my father and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Verse 28, my mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. And, look at verse 30, and if his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, which is us, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. That's exactly what he told David he was going to do to Solomon. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer, which means allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. If God made a promise to you, he's going to keep it. There was a day that I was in deep distress and I was going through Psalms. And I was reading them and I was seeing promises that God was making. But I was saying, God, that cannot be me. I'm too wicked. It cannot be me. I've done wrong. And God said, you're my son. And I don't break my promises. I don't. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. And we're going to come back with Jesus in Revelation 19 and rule as kings on this earth with him for a thousand years. My point is this. Now, does God cast people away? He certainly did. He certainly did. It was the ones that he could not correct with a rod. Have you ever known a child? Doesn't have to be yours. Have you ever known a child that no matter how many times they got a whooping, it didn't change them? Have you ever known anybody like that? Okay. I'm telling you, they're out there and they won't let, they could come to church every Sunday and not let God correct them. According to Hebrews 12, they are bastards and not sons. God won't have them. He will not have them. He does not know them. They are not born again. And that's the key. They are not, they pretend, they put on a show, they fake it, but God doesn't correct them. He can't. They won't accept God's correction. Be like a, a boy bent over with his father ready to paddle him, and all of a sudden the boy turns around, grabs the paddle, and he says, you ain't touching me, old man. What does the father eventually do? Get out of my house. Get out of my house. You might be my son by name. You might carry my last name in my genes. But I'm done with you. 
That's also biblical. Let's go to prayer. Father, help us to understand this. It's a great, it's a huge, huge thing. And Father, give us understanding of where we are with you. We're either your sons and your daughters or we're not. There's no halfway. There's no sort of. And there's no degrees of someone being a more important son than another. They either are or they are not. It's that simple. There's a difference between unleavened bread and leavened bread. There's a difference. It's easy to see it. The difference between wheat and tares. Once the harvest is in, it's even easy to see it. That's why you said you shall know them by their fruits. The Father, we just pray, God, that you open our eyes up to this. Help us to see where we are and who we are. So we fail not for your kingdom and the great and precious promises you've promised us. We ask you, God, to correct us when we've done wrong, to chasten us, God, when we disobey. We ask you that, Father, because we want to be your sons and we want you to be our father. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.